So I was recording my thoughts into my phone the other day. So part of the spending 10 bucks a day to promote each one of the items that I'm creating. Oh my God, I just ran upstairs. Why did I do that? And then I turned on the phone. Okay, as I catch my breath. The biggest thing that I've noticed is, well, I'll send people to the page. They'll check it out. They see it for the first time. Uh, each, each thing that I'm making gets its own web page all by itself. And all it does is explain that item. Well, a lot of people, and I'm guilty of this too, they'll see it in passing or they'll check on it and go, oh, that looks neat, but then something distracts you or you go, mm, yeah, not right now. Maybe I'll think of it later. How are you going to think of that later? So the second campaign that I created for promoting things is uh, one based on people who actually clicked on the ad but didn't buy. So what happened was is the people that went to the page but didn't buy anything Later on, they'll see it, they'll see the ad, and if they really were interested, or they'll go, hey, that thing, which again, I've done that. It's like, oh, I, that thing, I, I meant to check that out. I was wondering what the name of that was. So I'll click on it again, go to the page, and I already know what it is. I'll go and buy it. Well, that actually has been happening for me. I've created ads like that, and I'd say about 90% of the purchases that have been made came from those ads and that's another eye-opening thing that it just makes sense when people click on things it might be out of curiosity the people who actually click on it a second time are because they remember seeing it so that's another thing that's really been kind of a benefit of what i'm doing i'm tom ray and this is american bandito person that reached out to me today, he contacted me because he's been listening to the podcast and he's also from Wisconsin. My name is Peter Kersko and I'm a sculptor and educator. Here's the really cool thing about this interview. Even going back while I was editing it and listening to it, I just sit there and listen to how everything he says unfolds into this bigger picture. Like it's amazing. So just listen to what he says. And right when you think he's talking about one thing, it propels into another thing. Or when you ask him, how did this start? It starts from somewhere out of wherever. It's just a crazy interview. I really like the way that this guy's head works. I mean, if you talk about think outside the box, this is that guy. So you teach at the, at the university of Wisconsin? No. Uh, well, I do sometimes. Okay. Uh, my affiliation with UW was uh, primarily in 2017 when I was uh, invited to be a, um, a visiting artist or resident artist with the Art Arts Institute. Now it's called uh, Division of Arts. And uh, it was basically an interdisciplinary uh, residency that lasted the whole spring semester. And uh, I was sponsored by uh, multiple departments, physics, uh, biological systems, engineering, arts department, and uh, human ecology. Okay. And I was able to develop a, a, a fun course. And I had 14 students. And, uh, uh, and we, we studied and explored bio-inspired art and technology. Yeah, because on the site, it says that you're not, you actually didn't study to be an artist. Uh -uh. No, no, my background is in, uh, in science. I, uh, I spent a lot of time uh, studying physics and materials, and my focus was in, uh, in microscopy. But even that, I, didn't, I never really used microscopes for looking at stuff. When I was in grad school, I was uh, fortunate to work with the electron microscopes, and uh -huh. I broke one down and rebuilt it and started making stuff with it, tiny, tiny sculptures. Yeah, but you went and, the uh, exact opposite route of that. Your sculptures are huge. So how do, <laughs> how do you go from getting ideas from microscopic things to making like big things, like big installations? Well, I always was very fortunate that I had access to this amazing technology and I learned a lot and I always wanted to share that, you know, with the with younger students or, or uh, folks that I knew in my community that never had the opportunity to study or had the access to a technology and this opportunity opportunities that I have. What I decided was that I'm going to take all that, that is invisible around us and make it visible to these folks. You know what I mean? Does it make sense? No, you like made tiny, it very tiny, visible. <laughs> <laughs> tiny, tiny things that you have to use microscopes to look at okay, and just make it 
big and visible in their faces and interactive and participatory. So I guess I didn't realize that it stemmed from microscopes. When I was looking at it, uh, it was, I, I got the impression it was just based on nature. I didn't realize that you meant microscopic nature. It is based on nature. You, you're okay. correct. You're okay. Correct, but microscopes are just only one of the tools that I like to use. They're extension of our site, and that's something very accessible to everybody. Yeah. You know, people, everybody just love looking at things. Uh, you know, it's the easiest way how to communicate. It's through something that is an image. Basically, you can explore things that are very tiny on your fingertips that you'd never really pay attention to. You know, so I take tiny things in nature and try to uh, present it to uh, people who like making art with me or just looking at my art and show them and maybe teach them, maybe maybe make them learn something new. Where are you from? I'm from Slovakia. So Slovakia is a part of Czechoslovakia or used to. Okay. Czechoslovakia split up into Czech Republic and Slovakia in 93. What brought you here? Like, why would you come uh, from there to, you know, I came Wisconsin? I was an exchange student in 98. Yeah, and then I never left. I just stayed here and <laughs> went to a college. I went to Stevens Institute of Technology. Then I started working with uh, Matt Libera, who is a material scientist at the university. And, uh, and we just got into this fun project of uh, creating those tiny structures out of... Uh, materials that are unusual in a way that they're very soft and they're hydrated, they're full of water, you know, like sponges. Mm -hmm. And this was for biomedical applications. And I just started making art out of it because I had so much fun. See, that's the weird like connection that I don't get. How did that, how did one turn into the other? That's the part that I'm missing. Like, oh, and yeah, it's, it's I, awesome that it did. Too. I'm missing that part too. It's been a really nice journey. Came here 2007. For, for a senior year of high school, applied to a couple of colleges just to try it out. I, I never really planned of staying here. I, I was just, you know, all these kids around me were taking SATs and all these exams and stuff. I'm just tried out, you know, I barely okay. spoke English. I still have a very strong accent. And I got accepted to Stevens and uh, I got scholarship and uh, I got into honors program, which, mean, which meant at the time that I was able to take as many credits as I wanted to without paying extra. Oh, so cool. I was just taking all these crazy classes and just working really hard. And at the same time, I started working with this cool guy, Matt, and uh, he had this awesome uh, lab in a uh, in basement of one of the physics buildings. And it was just full of this stream technology, these microscopes. And I was just observing the graduate students, just, you know, helping them with their samples and whatever, just, you know, washing dishes and stuff like that. And I was still sophomore and by the senior year i took so many classes that they that i was able to get masters at the same time i was getting my bachelor's in physics they were like oh you have enough credits to get masters i was like okay so i got masters in four years and then i just got lazy and i stayed there <laughs> well, lazy is not a good way to say it. I, I, I was just having a really good time working with on that project that I was working on. They started sending me out to conferences to present my results, present my research. We started writing it, got published in all these fancy uh, science journals, and it was all peer-reviewed. Then I compiled all this work, and they gave me a PhD, and I was done with that. I couldn't stay there any longer. So I went to National Institutes of Health in, uh, in Bethesda, and I started working with Ralph Nasl in, uh, in one of the biophysics labs. And he's an awesome guy. He's uh, very encouraging, very uh, motivating, and he lets you do whatever idea you have. And it was just hmm. amazing set of resources to be in a, in a government lab. It was kind of a weird place because it wasn't, it was, they were having a hard time to, um, to get enough funding because it wasn't really directly connected to any of those you know, fancy researches, which is, you know, cancer or whatever, but right. you know, it's National Institutes of Health. It's just a pure science lab and people are again working on just pure science. So I, I spent two years there and during this process, I got very interested in taking all this knowledge that I was uh, getting uh, along this journey. And I started just, you know, sharing it with my friends and, and kids that I was working with in, uh, in after school programs and summer camps. And around this time, I became involved in an art collective in Jersey and DC that was very heavily influenced by graffiti and focused on public art. How did you get involved with that? 
I was just always surrounded by a lot of creative people. And so just people that you knew they were involved in it and yeah. you just kind of got yeah. involved in it. All right. 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 We started collaborating and creating uh, exhibitions together and large murals and, you know, and the projects were getting larger and larger and larger. And we started having a lot of, lot of young people involved in our projects and, we started going to classrooms and then, you know, I decided that maybe I should just go independent and develop my own path. I'm glad that you mentioned that you guys did murals because along with the stuff that I saw first, the stuff that you sent me, which are more of the large installations, which first of all, yeah. how would you describe those? What would you say is that style or that medium? The wooden sculptures? Yeah. So those are made out of pine lath, lath meaning thin strips of uh, wood. Mm -hmm. And this is a material that, is, that was traditionally used for making uh, plaster walls. Okay. I don't know if you've ever taken an old house apart. You have two by fours, and then on top of that, you have a nailed thin lath. And yeah. then on top of that, you put plaster. Okay. So this lath is always straight. It's always the same thickness, and it's just very, you know, industrial material. The supplier that I got is making it from wood that cannot be used for any other construction or something. So it's really just like a recycle, recycled or reused. And the idea behind that is that I'm taking an industrial material that is harvested from the trees and they're cut in, into uh, these very straight and sterile forms. And I'm taking it and I'm basically bringing it back into its original organic forms. So they look like, a, almost like tree trunks, but a little bit beyond that. But they're and, like, um, they're like funnels or like tornado trees or something like yeah. they kind of twist around. Uh, yeah. I, I was trying to figure out a way to describe it. Like even my yeah, wife was asking me. learning how to uh, work with it. I'm definitely pushing the elasticity of it you know, okay. to the point that they're breaking. So, you know, how much can I bend them? Also do murals you actually have one at festival foods here in madison oh that's right yeah so the style is very graphic -y. i like working with stencils so when i create something smaller size i actually cut the stencils and the reason why i work with stencils is that it allows me to um involve many people with me the reason i got into it was that i was a resident artist with the with the organization in Maryland called Artivate and they work with the Department of Journal Services and and I got access to work in uh, correctional facilities with young people who were in the system and it was always a challenge for other visual artists how to create something without spending too much time just learning the technique. And stencils are just very easy because you can just focus most of your time on actually developing the actual artwork. You know, painting is kind of easy or mechanical. or It's, it's just very, very established process and easy process. You know, just cutting, projecting the stencil, cutting the stencil, painting it. It's very simple. You don't have to spend too much time learning it. You can just focus really on developing the imagery. Creating the stencils, they're also multicolored. Do you have to plan out what stencils are going to go down when and cut them all out? Like, how do you how do you set it up for the people to use these stencils to create something? Again, depending on the on the size of the mural, it can last from a from a week to a couple of months. And it always starts with a with a community meeting where where people who are somehow Involved in a project, if it's in a neighborhood, it's a lot of neighbors who come out, a lot of kids from the schools. You know, if it's in a school, it's obviously the, the art teachers and their kids. So it's all different communities that, you know, get together. And first, we spend a lot of time just deciding what we're going to work on. And, you know, then we go home. The next week, we meet up and I have resources for them, either books or uh, photos or whatever that kind of demonstrates or, or show the, the stuff that they've, they've been talking about and they choose what exactly they want to do. They tweak it and then we project it onto a wall, onto a uh, poster boards, outline with markers, cut it out with exacto knives. And then we take the, the stencils and just paint with it. So the thing you're making the stencils out of, where do you get that? Cause that's gotta be pretty big. Oh, it's just a, you know, poster board. Okay. All right. It is 22 by 28 inches in size. And you just tape multiples together. Gotcha. You want to create larger, 
where do you personally work? Do you have a studio that you use? You know, do you work out of your home? Where do you do the stuff while you're planning or while you're creating your own things? You know, so a lot of the projects that we've been talking about are site specific. So I always work on site, you know, okay. whether it's the mural or the sculptures, the larger ones. But when I create at the home or, you know, in my studio, then I'm at home. You know, I, uh, I moved to uh, Waniwak in Wisconsin. It's about an hour, hour and a half northwest of Madison. And I was uh, lucky to find a place that had little old barn that I was able to convert into a studio. Oh, neat. Which for me, studio means just like a storage of tools because I just love being outside, you know? Uh -huh. so, uh, so it's just big door open and I'm outside just working on stuff. I've been here only, this is going to be my second winter, I think. This year I put a little stall into my studio. So let's see if I can. <laughs> Everything about it sounds really cool. I'm super jealous of your location. <laughs> well, you should come over. We, we, can, we also make uh, maple syrup. What? What do, you, yeah. what do you mean maple syrup? What are you talking about? Yeah, maple syrup. <laughs> oh my God, that's a huge jar of maple syrup. What made yeah. you start doing that? Just like everything else. I, I just find something that... Um, I don't understand and it's in nature and I just try thinking about it and try playing with it and making maple syrup is fascinating process because you start thinking how the sap flows in the trees. So in the winter when there are no leaves on the trees, when it's freezing, you know, the, the trees, trees appear to be dead. But then when the temperature goes above the freezing point during the day and then below during the night, probably like the second or third week of February, the sap starts being sucked from the, from the roots and goes into the canopy and it just flows through the uh, trunk of the tree. So when you uh, drill holes into the trunk of the tree, it just starts flowing out. Then you get, usually you can get like a gallon of sap out of one tap a day. Wow. And uh, you need 50 gallons of sap to make one gallon of syrup. So anyway, so this is super fascinating because you just have this huge volume of liquid just being, you know, flowing from from uh, from the roots up into the air, into the canopy. Yeah. And the thing about it, it's just like, how does this pump work? Uh -huh. Right? Like, what is the mechanism behind it, or what is the physics behind it? And uh, me just being fascinated by the whole magic of it, I just started making maple syrup. <laughs> 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 That's fantastic. So with all this stuff that you're doing, I mean, are you still doing any of the bioscience <laughs> thing? Or? Well, that's what I'm saying. You know, I do it in a different way. Okay. Like, uh, other example was I started wondering how, how is it possible that bees are making the perfect hexagons, right? Mm -hmm. And then again, there is there are some theories. One theory is that they just lay down wax in circles and then they uh, warm it up with their bodies and then by the surface energy of the molten wax, it just creates, uh, you know, it just gets sucked together and makes hexagons. But then I say asking how come the wasps make hexagons that is just like a paper, like a cellulose material. And nobody really described it yet. Like in the literature, how is it possible that they can make perfect hexagons? And it's really simple. It's just they, they don't know what the hexagon is. They don't know what is 60 degrees or 120 degrees or, you know, how or straight line. The only thing they know how to do is to make uh, circles, you know, so like dance in the circles or lay things down, the material down in circles. You know, and this idea came to me when uh, I made this little simple uh, carving tool, which is a router suspended from the engine hoist, so you can move it up and down, basically cut out like a concave, you know, bowl. When you just cut one out, you just basically get like this bowl. But when you start making multiple of them, Every time when they connect, it's a straight line. Yeah, so the overlapping circles, that overlapping part in between it, the part that overlaps, there's a straight line that goes from one yeah. end to the other. Yeah, the boundary is always perfectly straight. And and the, the bees, they just start building up on that line because they don't know if to go to the left or right of that line. They just stay on the line and it's perfect hexagons as a result. Wow. I'm not explaining very well. That's why. I'm no, here. but you're explaining it to a person that has no idea in the first place. And to me, I'm going, that makes sense. Commission 
commissioned work that you've done, like some of the bigger installations you've done? I get phone calls and people reach out to me that, you know, I've been doing for a while. So I'm, I'm lucky people are coming back or they see my stuff out there. And then what I also do a lot is I respond to call for art, you know, call for artists. Oh. And there is like a, you know, public commission announced. I just send my, send in my portfolio and my resume and see what happens where do you where do you find those what, what kind of places do you um, monitor to see them i really like a website called publicartist.org hmm. then there is also uh call for entry.org has also calls for exhibitions you know all sorts of different competitions and grants and you know you can you can see what 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 your artwork or what you like doing and you can you can search by uh genre or by location it gives you a list of open calls and you can respond to it so you're reaching out to people but do you promote your work i try to do it in kind of a natural way you know i i saw what you're doing and i reached out to you not yeah. really just to promote my work but i just wanted to meet you because i, I really enjoy how you talk to other artists and stuff and oh thanks very interesting your podcast was very interesting and stuff and and i just wanted to meet you so definitely a uh, direct communication or direct uh, personal relationships with people that's the best way to promote stuff i have the opportunity that i'm not really uh, tied down to any location because i can you really aren't else. i've been trying to figure like when you first started <laughs> contacting me you you were like mentioning arkansas and then you're like reedsburg and you're like but i'm in madison and yeah. i'm like where is My this guy is a new jersey phone number yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. I, <laughs> I maintain my instagram only because it's a good way to keep up my portfolio you know, yeah keep keep track of what i've done this year and you know i don't follow anybody everybody thinks that i'm an asshole because I'm <laughs> <following> <laughs> you're you're not you're not an internet guy is what you're no, saying and maybe you know and a lot of folks tell me that i should probably invest more more time into it but i don't know i just don't find it very interesting <laughs> So right now I'm really uh, studying patterns in nature and how everything is styled together and put together. And I'm going to present a few of those findings or some of the artwork related to, to this exploration in February in Albrick Gardens. There's going to be a show. Then I'm just getting ready for the next year. And also besides developing a few sculptural and mural project uh, projects, I'm also I came up with a new idea that I want to also do something different next year. And I want to go on a tour, make a bunch of uh, garden fur furniture and sculptures and just go to different farms and farmers markets and events and just sell it from my trailer, you know, and just be on the tour for like two months. That's cool. Are you, yeah, that's, that's, that's what you're trying to do or you actually are going to do it? I'm going to do it. Yeah. I'm okay. Do it. Oh, cool. How are you going to line that up? I'm in the process of talking to the hosts whether it's the farms or the events, yeah. the markets, and, and just come up with a schedule that will be effective. How are you finding the people that, that are hosting it? My first choice was farmers, okay. you know, local farmers here. Uh -huh. And I had the idea, oh, let's just do this show. I'm going to do a show on your farm, uh, your clients or your customers to come over. And if they like the garden bench or something, they can get it. And I was thinking more and more about it. I was like, oh, I should go to all these other different farms. There's so many awesome farms in, in Wisconsin. So I would like to approach all those farms and just uh, offer this to them. And some of them are very open to it. They really like the idea. And then there is also a lot of farmers. So the second step was like, oh, I should just go to the farmer's markets mm -hmm. some days or something. And then slowly, you know, I then I started talking to other events and, and it's just the, the calendar is filling up and I would like to do it. April, I would like to start in April, May, June. Wow. Months. And you just started looking up farms and contacting people. Yeah. When did you get this idea? <laughs> oh, I just went to uh, Texas uh, recently. Uh -huh. Last week I was in Texas. Okay. So I was there for two weeks and I had kind of free time. And I got tired of looking for uh, hotels because I wanted to travel from spot to spot. Mm-hmm. And, and I was just like, oh, I'm not going to even stay in a hotel. So I just stayed in my truck. I just got really into it. And I just started thinking I should just do this more. I should just go on vacations in my truck. I don't need to go, you know, like plan vacation. Yeah. And I was like, okay, so I go for a vacation. Maybe I should just bring something with me and sell it. I should go on a tour. 
Uh-huh. I just hook up my trailer, fill it up with furniture, and go on a tour. So the whole you know, thing I mean? stemmed because you enjoyed staying in your trailer. <laughs> instead in my truck, in your yeah. truck instead of in a hotel. <laughs> outside, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Just> think outside. <laughs> oh, my God. Ideas come from the strangest places. That's so funny. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And the Walmart Walmart parking lots are the safest places to sleep. Yeah, they've been they've been kind of the hub for park your place uh park your stuff yeah. there to stay overnight, aren't haven't they? Yeah, I didn't know about that. Mm-hmm. You know, I some usually I travel in straight line from point A to point B and it's usually thousand miles, fifteen hundred miles, and I sleep at the uh, rest stops and I couldn't find many rest stops around larger cities. Mm-hmm. Walmarts were awesome. There's so many people doing it. There were a lot of people there, is what you're oh, saying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was curious. It was like a, yeah, it almost sometimes it almost turned into like a tailgate party. <laughs> it was, it was great. So really, everything everything he said came from such strange places, and I loved the hell out of that. Anyway, so next week I'm going to be talking to a guy who I met on Instagram as well that is also trying to create his own sort of passive artwork income by using print-on-demand and Amazon. So I was kind of psyched to talk to this guy. So check that out next week. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to this show at AmericanBandito.com. The music for the show is by my band, Lorenzo's Music. And you can check out more of that at Lorenzo'sMusic.com. So until next week, so long.